Hello, welcome back, welcome back to the Instagram live channel. I'm on here every single night at eight o'clock, a live stream every night here at eight, um, to talk all things whiskey, to chat with you about uh, some things going on, some adventures happening, and some things happening at the society, and to, to talk whiskey with you for 20, 30 minutes or something each night, and that's what we're gonna start with tonight. We're gonna talk about, a bit about a release coming up. Uh, Dram and Draw, uh, good to see you, Jeremy. Uh, 45 Fins, Squizzer, Crispy Roast Potatoes, <laughs> uh, Tyriel, Just Dramming, Robert Akers, etc. Hello. Eric, thanks everyone for joining in. Uh, Whiskey Sec, good to see you. Look, uh, thanks everyone for joining in. It's eight o'clock every night here that I'm doing a live stream that I'm talking about a few things about whiskey. You might learn a few things, you might ask a few questions, it might be a bit of fun. So yes, bring on Bailey Rant. <laughs> Thank you, yes, Bailey Rant. Look, I'm gonna start with, I'm gonna start with um, a review, a review, not a review, some tasting notes. I don't like the word review. I don't like reviewing whiskey. Uh, I review whiskey in a, in a strictly, in a sort of a tasting panel format. I don't like reviewing whiskey in a, um, in a critical format for, uh, in this format. I don't know why, it's just, just who, how I am. I think reviewing, especially whiskey that has already been reviewed by an expert tasting panel seems a bit redundant. But I like talking tasting notes and about things upcoming with, with Outturn, with society, and what's happening in this Outturn, which I'm gonna talk a bit about tonight. Um, Jamie Poos, Sally, uh, Maris, Marisam, Marisam, Mads, thank you everyone, everyone for joining in. Um, Tonight, I'm gonna to start with uh, this lovely seven-year-old cask from 26.126, uh, a Wildcat did purr. If you're at the Melbourne gathering, you got a chance to taste this already. SMWS Germany joined, good to see you. Um, if you were at the Melbourne tasting uh, last week, you already got to taste this. Uh, if you weren't, however, then you won't know what I'm talking about. So, there's the sound. Isn't that wonderful, isn't that a wonderful sound? Um, so I'm going to pour a, just a, just a wee dram of this to assess it, to assess it, uh, to write up some of my own tasting notes, and make some and make some um, make some notes for you to, to know what's going on. So this is Distillery Twenty Six Cask One Twenty Six. That means it's the hundred and twenty six whiskey that has been approved by our tasting panel from Distillery Twenty Six. The hundred twenty sixth cask from Distillery Twenty Six. Distillery Twenty Six. We don't put the distillery name on the bottle. Uh, as you may know already, but we it is pretty easy to work out what it is. Wildcat should be the first giveaway, given their um, iconography at the distillery of a wildcat. Um, what we've got here is a second fill bourbon barrel, um, Highland whiskey, 60.8%, super waxy and floral notes that I found the first time I knows this, so I'm going to get back into this now. I'm not going to add any water just yet. Uh, SMWS UK joined as well. Wow, I think the whole international team's tuned in tonight. It's amazing. Uh, I better not say anything too controversial then. I'm, I'm supposed to do my rant tonight. <laughs> uh, SW Gasson joined, and Alex says, such good spirit character in 26s. Totally agree, Alex. I've been lucky enough to taste some uh, 26s, distillery 26s, uh, that were six years old, seven years old, eight years old, some 14 year old, of course, some 15 year old, and some 30 year old from distillery 26. I can safely say the younger casks excel, they really do. Immediately, I get like a there's a dusty note in there, and you don't normally get a dusty note out of a young whiskey. There's a very waxy floral note, though, just like waxy paper. And waxy paper is one that you often find out of Distillery Twenty Six. That waxy note. They were across the road from a distillery called Brora. Now they're called something else. Does anyone else want to type it? I'm, I shouldn't. We anyway. Uh, Barley Brains and Tim, thanks for joining. Tim and Seamus, my lucky night. Look who's tuned in tonight. This is amazing. What? What? A, <laughs> all the international teams. Oh, Louis, good to see you. Cleanly, uh, she's correct, Robert. Oh, whew. that is a very spirit forward whiskey. I talked a little bit the other, about the other night. On here about how um, how some whiskies have a distillery character um, that would be a shame to hide behind a good cask, and then other distilleries their character isn't so pronounced. So you can put them in a you can put the spirit in a sort of a, a wacky wine cask and see what it does to it. 
I, in general, am not a huge fan of wine casks. I've said this before as well. I'm not covering new ground here. Uh, I find most wine casks to be a little bit, um, a little bit off balance here, hold on. I find most wine casks to be uh, quite, um, a little bit hot and a little bit sort of unnecessarily masking what could have been a great spirit. Um, it's amazing with chocolate. I do have some chocolate over there, so I might try that out. Uh, SNVS UK. We're all for the here for the rant, mate. <laughs> ah, yes. Well, I'll get to the rant. I'm going to finish this whiskey first. Maybe I need this whiskey to get on the ramp. How good? Uh, had a good smoky coke lately? Uh, yes, I did actually, Louis. Thanks for asking. I had an uh, Ard begging coke the other day, uh, the other night. That was last Friday night. I think you saw the photo of that one. Uh, in in um, am I allowed to say it out loud? Am I allowed to say the name Ascas? Am I allowed to say that? It doesn't matter. It's all a bit obscure, isn't it? Um, wax on, wax off. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yes. Thank you for the Miyagi reference there, uh, Seamus. Um, cool. It's it's such a balanced whiskey, even at that proof. It, I, I'm gonna try it with a drop of water. I don't think it needs this. Needs it. Um, just a few drops into that one. Far more floral now, like way more of that sort of like almost like um like violets and blossom. Yeah, that's a good one. Coastal waxy, superb. Rustic tones and subtle oils. I love it. It's it's really like it's got a lot going on in that in that whiskey. That's fun. Um, uh, hey Matt, sorry I can't wait your rant tonight. Yes, it's coming. I've got a, it's only a slight rant, really. Um, what's the sweetest SNWS release you've tasted? Never had the chance to taste any of these bottling, sadly. Uh, Tyrrell. Okay, that's a good question. Um, the sweetest society bottling I've ever tasted. The sweetest. There was a 125, which is Glenmorangie, uh, a while ago that I really loved, that was super sweet. Although, although, uh, I had a 12 dot something recently and a 68 dot something recently that were both super sweet. We get, if you keep an eye out for the sweet, fruity, and mellow flavor profile, or the deep, rich, and dried fruits flavor profile, most of the casks in those two have a lovely big sweet note, especially sweet, fruity, and mellow. There's a lovely lot of sweetness. Actually, actually, I take that back. It was Distillery 135. It was 135.1 or three. I can't remember. They were both 16 or 17 year old Sauternes casks from Loch Lomond. Delicious stuff. Banging whiskies. Loch Lomond is single casks. Like, they were ex Sauternes, uh, 16 year old Loch Lomonds. They were absolutely incredible. Uh, yes, 128.6. Alex, there's a cool story behind that cask. Um, I think if you recall, you got my I think you got my bottle of that. You'll have to share me some if there's any left. Uh, the liquor from the, the liqueur from the Vault's dinner. Yes, I'll agree that was extremely sweet as well. Uh, okay, well look, you know, whilst I'm enjoying this, um let me, uh, what, what does he say? What is whiskey sec? Uh, gonna be sitting there hitting refresh at twelve. Yeah, whiskey sec, me too. I mean, I don't get any special treatment on these casks, as in like, oh I have to go I have to compete with members on some of these things. But I generally let members go first. So um, I'm going to let you know. I'm going to let you in on a little bit of a, a little bit of my rant. Look, my rant tonight was uh, is um, I had a member recently send me a message about some. Uh, I have to pick my words really carefully here. About uh, now, look, I'm actually you know what. Before I go on rant, I'm going to preface this by saying that I'm a huge fan of the Australian whiskey distilling scene. Uh, those who know me well know that I advocate for it. I've consulted with Australian distilleries. I've worked with them in cask procurement, cask management, uh, tasting panels with Australian whiskies. Lots of fun always. I'm fully supportive of the industry just because I work for the Scotch Malt Whiskey Society. We are looking at Australian casks. We are looking at working in Australian whiskey. That much is not too much a secret anymore. Uh, as the society has bottled uh, American whiskies, Irish whiskies, Japanese whiskies, Welsh whiskies, Indian whiskies, etc. It's only a matter of time, but that time will come through. That matter of time will be a matter of time of getting the right cask at the right price and making sure that it's something that members will want to buy and open and enjoy, not a shelf piece, not a, not a piece of ceramic on a shelf. So my rant needed that preface to say that um, I, I'm not, this is not me bagging on the, the um, Australian whiskey distilling scene at all. Because as I said, I've worked quite closely with a lot of distillers distilleries and distillery managers in, in their setup, in their tastings, in their spirit character. So, and I'm something I'm hugely proud of working in. However, however, my preface is saying this. Uh, look, 
there's only one way. My rant has to, has to I'm going to temper it just ever so slightly, but the rant is kind of along the lines of saying, if, and this applies to Scotch whiskey as well, if the bottle is not deserving of some ridiculous packaging, then don't do it. It's as simple as that. There you go. That's the premise of my rant. Let me expand on that. If the bottle is not worthy of the packaging, then don't do it. If you showed me a 50-year-old Macallan, and it comes in a Lalique crystal decanter, uh, and a you know big box and decanter and pomp and circumstance, and it has a real sense of occasion. Uh, I don't care even if there's smoke that emanates out of it and there's LED light, LED LED lighting that lights up the bottle and stuff. That's I'm completely fine with that. Um, I hope Johnny's here for this. <laughs> He'll tune in. Don't worry, Seamus. He's here most nights. Um, I have no problem with that. Uh, I, I used to. I used to. I've changed my mind on this over the years. I, I used to. I used to despise whiskey, whiskey packaging. I thought it was all just a all just gimmicky garbage. But then I realised that a lot of people, most most whiskey buyers, most whiskey drinkers, consumers, they buy, they buy it. The packaging is a huge purchasing decision. It, it plays a huge role in it. I completely understand that the marketing behind it. And if you spend twenty thousand dollars on a bottle of whiskey, you want it to come with some certain sense of um, presentation. Now, this is something the society for years and years and years never has done. One dot one eight three, a forty eight year old from Distillery One, came that looked in exactly the same bottle as a seven year old from Twenty Distillery Twenty Six. I kind of loved that for ages. I was kind of like, well, that's that's fine. They should all look the same. However, I've now come around to thinking that if you are going to spend that much on a whiskey, it should have a bit more uh, circumstance. But it's not just the cost. And I want to preface this by saying it's not just the cost. Because I could sell you this seven-year-old bottling for $3,000. If you want it for $3,000, you can have it for $3,000. I think it's just one sixty dollars or something. But um, one seventy, dollars sorry. Uh, but so therefore, a $170 single cask shouldn't really, doesn't really need... Uh, you know, a fancy box or a presentation box or black this or, you know, LED lighting out of the mahogany box. Um, yeah, with a bifold mahogany box, exactly. Um, so, well, it doesn't need that. But if I sold it to you for 3000 maybe it does. It's a special whiskey. And I'll remove the age statement from it as well. Do you see where I'm going with this? There's some Australian whiskey on the market at the moment, uh, and I'm not naming any names tonight, and I'm not. It's not for me to make that kind of judgment or comment, um, but it, it's uh, which is worryingly, uh, worryingly gaudy. I'm going to say, there we go. I don't mind saying that. It is worryingly uh, tacky to put you know three, four year old whiskey with you know big gaudy boxes and and caps and and. Uh, fake story behind it all. Um, I think it's all. I think it's all a bit sort of silly. Uh, and so you just sort of say, well, how much am I spending on that packaging, and how much am I spending on that silly story that goes along with it? And it's just that's what the part that bothers me is that uh, there's only so many ways you can. Um, uh, it's really harsh to say polish a turd, but you know where I'm going with that. There's only so many ways to sort of, you know, re. Uh, Re, re, recreate that story that he has, requires a certain sense of sort of complete dismissal of reality. Uh, that's that's one way of putting it, and I, I have to I have to tread carefully here because, like I said, I'm not I'm not naming and shaming anyone, and there's no actual distillery that comes to mind immediately when I say this. Uh, but it is there are some distilleries. No, there are well, there obviously are, but look, there are some distilleries where I just go, your product is okay, your packaging is excellent, and your pricing is accordingly. And you say you, you've got you've got to get three out of three right in this day and age, especially with the number of distilleries. Um, lipstick on a pig. There you go, Morsey. That's a nicer way of putting it. Thank you, thank you. That's the one I was looking for. Um, yeah, well, whiskey sec. I, would, I I'd tend to agree with that. Um, it does need a rant. I, I tell you what. Um, yeah, it, yeah. The needs to take it down a notch. You know what? Hot dog extravaganza. I couldn't agree more. That's exactly my point here. Uh, I think we're getting ahead of ourselves a bit. Now, the modern whiskey industry in Australia, the modern whiskey whiskey industry in Australia, as in sort of Bill and Lynn Lark onwards, uh, there's whiskey being distilled in Australia since the 1820s or somewhere thereabouts. I've done my research on that. You can check it all out. Um, the 1820s or thereabouts was when Australian whiskey first started being distilled. Uh, but we're in that modern era now uh, with you know, the resurgence of Australian whiskey, I should say. 
And I think, you know, after what, whatever year it was, 1995 or something, um, 1993 for Bill and Lynn, I can't remember the exact years off the top of my head, 27 something years. I think we need, I think we need to sort of just take a step back and say, um, where are we heading as an industry? Where are we heading as, as where, what, and where do we want it to be? Because I can guarantee you when Ardbeg or um, Klein Leash or whatever distillery it is in, in, the, um, in the United Kingdom, in Scotland, I should say, um, when they first started out in 1815, in 1790, in 1810, it wasn't, it didn't, it wasn't like 30 years later they're putting their whiskey into gold ornate bottles trying to capture a market. Yes, there would have been marketing tricks even then to get people interested in their product, but the interest in the product should be in the spirit, should be in the quality and production of the spirit. Andrew was in here the other night where he said very correctly that the art of distillation is making flavored alcohol. Just think about that for a second. It's not about making an alcohol that you can get flavor out of a cask. That's the secondary and, and desirable aspect. It's about making flavored alcohol, about making a, a spirit quality desirable at the, at the onset. And it's kind of like you get to this point where you say, well, what is the, what's the balance point of saying, uh, you know, well, ah, oh, well, it, it's, it doesn't matter how it tastes anymore because hey, it's got a big gold leaf and comes in a big fancy mahogany box and it's, oh, it's only 1,500 a bottle. I've got nothing wrong with spending that much on it. If you want to spend that much on a bottle of whiskey, go for it. Just make sure that what's inside the bottle is befitting of the price, not just what's outside the bottle. And I can't stress that enough. I've got no problem with fancy packaging if the packaging is befitting of the product. Think about that for a moment. That's my main rant for the moment. And I'll just um, I'll just get back on that for a moment. Uh, look, that's Monarch Perth. You haven't missed much. Don't worry. Um, can I get a Wildcat for 100 if I send you a PET bottle to stick it in? <laughs> Dr. Akers, that's a big hard no from me. I'm very sorry. Um, Monarch Perth, I'll just I'll get I'll recap on that rant. Um, 1822 to 1839, Dram and Draw. Yes, you're correct. So it was that sort of era. It was 1820. There was there was evidence of distilling happening in Australia. Um, and it's it's obviously grown since then. I mean, it grew and stopped, and you can thank DCL for that. And that's one I can name and shame that in mind. They're the biggest in the world. 92, yeah, um, with your fanciness. Yeah, fanciness. Screw your fanciness there, duck it bucket. Come on, mate. Uh, I was in Scotland a couple months ago, and this is from Tyrrell, and they had Sullivan's Cove bottles going for 500 pounds plus. Couldn't believe it. And I know the new release is a minimum 750, 800 yucks. Okay, Tyrrell, I'm just going to... Look, you've mentioned Sullivan's Cove a couple of times tonight. I'll mention them as then. I have an enormous amount of respect for Sullivan's Cove, though. So let me tell you exactly why. If you see a bottle of Sullivan's Cove for $750, $800, or sometimes even a bit more, $850, $900, as I've seen them, you're sort of talking French oak prices there, and their French oaks are quite desirable to collectors and buyers. And also remembering that most Sullivan's Cove is 11 to 16, 11 to 17-ish years old. There's been a couple of 18s as well, a couple of 18 year olds, I think, yeah. That's actually got age in the cask. I can understand that pricing. The market will correct itself over time on this on these kind of things. But if you tell me that that's a 17 year old Sullivan's Co for 900, I'm like, that's a bit rich for my blood, but I, I think the pricing is correct and the market will bear it and they sell out instantly anyway. And the packaging isn't that fancy. It's in a cardboard box at best, isn't it? It's like a slide out sort of new box that they've created, that new cradle kind of style box. That's fine. It's $900 whiskey. I hope it's got a nice box. For years and years, I just had a cardboard box, like a normal box. There's one sitting over here somewhere. So just one of their French oaks over there somewhere. I can't see it at the moment, but it's in a cardboard box. And it's like, it was like, then I think, you know, 900 for one of those. Yes, I think that's worth it. I'll be honest. I, I don't, I, it's not It's not for me as a regular drinker. Um, this is more my sort of, my, my speed, I'll be honest. Um, but I'll, I'll, I'll just say it. It's just like, I saw a whiskey recently, and I'm not, again, not naming any names or distilleries or anything, where the spirit couldn't have been any more than three and a half years old, just based on the age of the distillery. So the spirit was three and a half years old, and they're asking 1,200 a bottle. 1,200 a bottle for a three and a half year old whiskey that didn't have an age statement, was, wasn't cast strength, was single cask, but you say, Really, I mean, I'm not, I'm not judging the price entirely on stats either. It comes down to taste and it comes down to what you deem collectible and what you like to buy. That's fine. There's so many factors involved in the economics of pricing these things that I can't just pinpoint one. But there is enough that I go, hmm, 
that's a terrible, terrible idea. And you say, no, I'm not gonna spend 1200 on something that has no transparency, that has a terrible story that's selling the, uh, the wrong part of the, the, the side of it. It's selling the wrong part of what it should be. It should be a discussion around the spirit and the, the, the quality of the spirit. And that's one thing, if I'm being completely honest, that most Australian distillers should pay a bit more attention to is the quality of spirit, is the what they intend to uh, create out of the quality of their spirit, not just the quality of the cask. Huge, huge difference there. There's a line that Bill Lark used to say, and I'm sure he still likes to say it, uh, but I, I loved hearing him shout it at a tasting was, uh, shit in, shit out. Pardon my, pardon my French for those who don't like cussing. Um, and it meant that if you put shit spirit into a cask, you're gonna even, it doesn't matter how good that cask is, it's gonna come shit spirit back out again. You, distillers, and there are some amazing distillers in, a, in, a, in Tasmania, in Australia, mainland, that pay an enormous amount of attention to their spirit. There's a number of them, and I think, and I fully respect what they're doing. There's quite a few that don't. And I think that's really, that's, that's really quite telling. We've got a long way to go in the local scene, um, uh, in local spirits. Uh, like I say, I've consulted with a number of distilleries and I do a lot of work with them in, over the years and I think it's, they've done some amazing work. Uh, I just think that there's, there's room to grow and there's room to improve. Let me grab some of these comments before I get too carried away and I'm preaching a bit here. Uh, but then like Glenn Farkas, same packaging all the way to I think the 40 year old. SMN though, the, the 30 and the 40 now come with a, a little wooden uh, little wooden box actually with the, like the doors, the warehouse doors on the front. You can check it out online now. They've changed the packaging, but I think it's befitting of a 30 or 40 year old whiskey to have some nice packaging. It's fine. Uh, in fact, Ian McWilliam from the distillery uh, told a story at the Sydney tasting um, at the Glenn Farkless SMWS event we did with them uh, two months ago, three months ago. Um, he, we did a marvelous tasting for 80 members downstairs in the RAC. It was a lovely night. Um, we tasted like eight different casks. Uh, he made a comment how it's the Asian market wouldn't wouldn't even touch the forty year old without the box. They need a bit more sort of um, a bit more bling. He said for that market, especially for the mainland Chinese and Taiwanese market of uh, Glen Farkless. That, that's fine. Hey, it's, it's a commercial decision that I get. Um, and the only difference with family cask is rather simple box. Yeah. Preach, yeah. Sorry, preacher. I told you I'm preaching. Uh, thanks for joining. Uh, thanks everyone who's been joining in. By the way, um, Stephen Oss, 1984. Good year, good year. I forgot about the red box. He knocked up the. Uh, yeah, he knocked it up in the shed. Right, that's right. He built it in the shed, and then that sort of became the concept that they now get manufactured in China to build for for their for their Chinese audience. But we see it out here as well. Um, uh, Ali whiskey says SC Core Range whiskeys are 220, 335, 50. Not that far off. I think what others charge 700 mils, and that said a lot. Age for a lot longer than, than most using larger cask maturation. If we want to jump on that little tidbit that I love I love jumping on, and by the way, as I said earlier, I've got huge respect for SC, uh, Southern's Cove. Like I said, I think it's very befitting of their pricing, whatever pricing they come up with but lately. It's all been selling out. The market will, will bear what they're charging because it's actually well priced for what it is. It's a, it's a long aged 700 mil bottle, often a, a very decent proof at the very least, uh, if not, and so like 47.5 and up from there. Um, I think the move to move double cast to 50 has been a very good, very good one. But if we're gonna talk, if I'm gonna keep on my bandwagon here on my rant, because I'm in, I'm in, the, I'm in the zone now, uh, the other rant I was, gonna, I was gonna touch on tonight really was cask size. And I've, I've talked about this before. This whole small cask matured thing happening in local spirits, I think is to the detriment of itself. It's it uh, speeds up the aging process, supposedly, uh, and it means that they can get to market quicker to satisfy demand. However, demand is going to be, is, is, is such a, a fluid variable based on um, supply and based on market reaction. So you, what, what you have this problem is that what small casks do, and I, when I say small, I mean 20 to 50 liter casks uh, in Australia, what they end up doing, and I, I'm, I'm quite, I've been outspoken on this before. And I can't believe that I have been anyway. Uh, what I mean by um, these 20 to 50s that we see are often, um, they leave the spirit, especially 20s, two years on a 20 liter barrel. They leave the spirit uh, over oaked and under mature. Hear me out on this, over oaked, but under mature. So you end up with a spirit that has picked up way too much oak influence because the spirit to wood ratio is way out of whack and 
they're after just two years, they, they actually taste still new makey and under uh, under mature. Overly oak, yet still new makey. It's the worst of both worlds. It tastes like a whiskey that's over matured and under matured all at once and it never meets in the middle. Lee Wallace, Dwight's Two Rupees Brewing. Thank you everyone for joining in. Um, yes, okay, so that's right. Robert Aiken says it right. It speeds up wood interaction. It can't speed up aging. And maturing, yes. And no time for the uh, flavonoids to develop in the spirit. Starwood comes to mind. Which part of, what part of Starwood comes to mind for you, um, Hot Dog Extravaganza? I'd love to hear your comment on that, actually. Um, see, there's, and that's, every distillery in Australia is doing something different, just like they are in Scotland. And they're all doing little differences and things here. A lot of them are sourcing from the same suppliers, though, in terms of wash and in terms of um, cask. But I think this whole sort of small, these this small cask scourge, uh, where of 20 to 50 litre casks, I think needs to, it honestly needs to be killed off. Some distilleries have worked that out nice and early. Um, they started dumping the 20s into 100s, or even the, or even into 200s, which I think is an even better decision. We're going to warm a climate down here. We, we've got the room. Now, I've got no problem, like, 20s for projects and things like that. I'm outspoken on this. I know some people will disagree with me on the 20s thing and, and 20s and 50s. I just think they, they can produce a marvellous result. Uh, but it's just, it's for, they can produce a marvelous result in single cask form, they can. However, for longevity and for uh, control of that spirit, and especially as a house style, if you want to develop a house style as a new distillery, you are going to be hitting a wall very shortly, like very shortly. They're so variable. Casks are so variable. So they have all these differences between them. So... You can't, yeah. If you're looking for a house style, there you're going to be, um, you're going to be disappointed. Um, the real problem is people who measure when whiskey is ready by the cask size. Too many arbitrary measures on casks. Alex, I couldn't agree more. Too many arbitrary measures. It's like it's oh, it's ready now because it's this size. Oh, it's ready now because it's this. Why? Who? Who comes up with this? It's like I tasted a whiskey the other day actually, which was a from a twenty liter cask that was um, one year and one month old. So by anyone's standard, not whiskey yet. Uh, I tasted it and went, actually, can you dump that now? Because that's ready. It's like, and they're like, oh no, it's not whiskey yet. Oh, okay, well, see you in 11 months and see what happens to it. Yeah, okay, you know. Um, you've got to taste it, that's right. You've got to taste it, Alex. It comes down to the taste in the, in the not, and not the numbers. Trust, trust your palate. And I, I, I saw a comment from a distiller on, the, uh, on, a, on a Facebook group. Ah. Uh, a, while, a little while back saying, um, what proof should I bottle my spirit at? It's like, ah, okay. I, I just, you know, this is these, these kind of things where, like I said, we're still teething in an industry. It's still growing. It's still learning. We're still making mistakes. And I think we could learn a lot from other countries that have been through this. They've already done this. They've already made these mistakes. They've already made these. For those who have joined in late, I'm drinking uh, 26.126, a Wildcat did purr. This is in our, our October outturn, which I'm just going to flash up on screen now. That's out this Friday. I'm hoping every live stream this week I'll get a chance to talk about um, one of the whiskeys or one of the rums or something in the October outturn in anticipation for Friday's release this week. If you want me to, of course. I'm happy to talk about other things. But I, I love talking about some of the stuff coming up in outturn because it's, 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 it's a juicy outturn, this one, with some lovely casks in it. Yeah, the accounts come up with it. Uh, is that where the case... Okay, so, um, question is is that where the use of x fortified wine barrels come in to hide the heat of the young spirit uh whiskey and drinkies yes yes and no but uh that's sort of a different topic uh, in in my opinion that's sort of like that's the example of where um some distillers like to overuse overuse wine casks and it can hide a poor spirit if it, even if it's not hiding a poor spirit it can often mask what would have been a great spirit that's even more of a crime in my opinion. I need some water, I'm talking too much. I'm the one doing all the talking. Uh, okay. So like I said, that's my little rant for tonight. I told you, I promised you there would be one. I sort of started talking about packaging, but then I sort of got stuck into sort of like small casks, but not really, I've got nothing against small casks, but if you're trying to develop a house style, if you're trying to go for, move forward and just judge on maturation on size rather than on taste, uh, I think you're you're up, you're going to hit a wall, and I and I, I think a lot of distillers could learn something from that. Like I said, it's there's a lot of work I've done with it, at least seven or eight distilleries now, 
in Australia, helping them out with things like house style, helping them out with spirit character, tasting notes, flavor notes, um, spirit runs, all that kind of stuff. Um, Bailey Rant Mondays. <laughs> um, yeah, tasting notes in the 52 malls, you pay attention. <laughs> I don't know what that means, Robert. You'll have to hit me up. Oh, did we, we had that in the Melbourne Festival Feast, I think, the 52. That was a challenging whiskey, if I recall. Uh, that's the that's a diplomatic way of saying it, but it is true. It was true. It was challenging. It was one of those whiskies that I didn't enjoy that much on the day, but I think I may have enjoyed more in a different circumstance, maybe different in the line, maybe somewhere else in the lineup. Um, it kind of reminded me of that sort of that that smell of wick, though, didn't it? Kind of like it's it's going to be it's going to be it's going to be not to everyone's taste, but um, yeah. Mm. That's a lovely whiskey. I've let that open up now for the last 20, 30 minutes as I've been talking. And it's um it's become far more sort of coastal and fruity. Waxy and fruity and coastal. Lovely. Really lovely casket one. And it just goes to show, as an example of what I was just talking about just before with that rant, that's a seven-year-old whiskey. So you're getting that one? Yeah, that's a seven-year-old whiskey. It's uh, it's mature for a seven year old whiskey. It's ready. It was ready to be bottled at seven years old. That means that it's that they're aiming for that fruity, really sort of like visceral waxy note, and that's something that is, is exciting for me. And I think it's one that we can look at and go, you know what, that's exciting. Um, so yeah, um, okay. Well, let's let me answer a few more questions before I get out of here. Um, shit in, shit out. Can we talk about new make etc. One time. And by we, I mean you. <laughs> SM, yeah, no, we, we can talk about it because I love your questions and I love answering them and coming back to these kind of things. So yes, we can talk about it. Absolutely, it's fine. Um, we can talk about new make. Why don't we make that a subject of tomorrow night? We'll do a new make and taste another thing from Outturn. So let's talk new make tomorrow night and the importance of new make, uh, what it means, how to make it, all that kind of stuff. We won't go too much into production tomorrow night because it's, A, it's not my expertise and B, it's, uh, it's not my... Um, no, we'll just we'll, we'll go over production a little bit of new make, but we'll we'll talk a bit about the importance of it tomorrow night. That might be a good one, Matt. I'd love to talk about filling casks at sixty three point four in Australia sometime. Sam, you know what? That's a really interesting point. That's a really interesting point. Uh, actually, why don't you know what? If you've got time now, I've got time now. Okay, here we go. Why don't we just why don't we jump into that a little bit? Um, uh, okay, so let's just that's one little new make thing I want to talk about there from Sam. Um, look at filling casks at 63.4 in Australia. Casks are filled in, in Scotland at 63.4% most of the time. And we're talking for single malt whiskey, that is. Grain whiskies are often filled higher, uh, but single malt whiskey, malt whiskey in about how it goes in at 63.4 is how it should. Um, uh, between 58 and 60. So Sam says he's been reading his research from the bourbon world and oak releases a lot of the sugars between 58 to 60. Since we only seem to go up in ABV, are we missing some of the best cask parts of the cask? Yeah. Well, it's... Okay. Um, Lockie, I'll put... This video will go up on YouTube anyway. Don't worry. That's fine. They all, they will. They all will. So this is why, like, talking about this on this new make level is kind of like... Uh, the sugars, go, the, that's right, the sugar reaction point between 58 and 60 can be very strong. I'm going to give you two examples. There's a distillery in Melbourne that fills all their casks these days at 55. And I think that's a smart move. Uh, just it, it, It's often decisions made by accountants, not by... um. Oh, what have I done with my keyboard? There? Oh, there we go. Um, so it's often decisions made by accountants to fill at 63.4 or even higher. There are, uh, if, you, if you look at the Edrington distilleries, uh, McAllen... Highland Park, Glen Rothies, they all fill close to 70 now at 70% ABV. Uh, which means that sometimes we've seen some, we've seen a couple of younger Glen Rothies through in the last couple of years, some eight, nine, 10 year old single casks uh, that were from sherry casks, sherry hogsheads, I should say, um, that were sitting at 65, 66% ABV. Uh, they, they were great, but they were hot, they were big. Um, Filling at 55 means you're maturing water in a cask, more water in a cask. So therefore, you know, on an accountant's balance sheet, it's like, you know, putting, paying for the maturation of water is kind of like seems wasteful when you can dilute at the end and make more spirit output from it. 
So the lower your fill strength, the less the less overall output at the end you're going to get uh, of whiskey, presumably, depending on lots of factors, of course. But um, uh, yeah, and there's there's you put filling at 55 as some distilleries do now uh, means you're getting a a, a richer um, wood sugar ratio coming through at that proof. It doesn't burnish the wood too harsh. Pardon me. There's a distillery, however, I met. <laughs> there's some distillers I met out, out in WA. Uh, I, I won't say who. There's a distillery in WA that's filling all their casks. Sam, you're going to love this one. They're filling, uh, yeah, qu- quality over quantity, though. Exactly, that's the problem, yeah. Output, output, out for, for a lot of distilleries, though. It's not about... Then quality is so, so far in the back of their mind it drives me mental sometimes. So um, there's a distillery out in WA filling... Spirit into the casks at 40%, saying, and I asked, why? How are you justifying that? And they said, well, you know, it's in Australia, so all this, we lose more water than alcohol, so therefore they'll go up in proof anyway. And we only need them to set at 43 to 46 when we release them. <laughs> That's a huge risk. That's a huge risk, taking that much of a risk on... Um, on to, to ensure that it, it, it sits at that level for that long. Like, hmm, they might end up with uh, six, seven dozen casks that are sitting at 37% after a few years. What do you do then? Make a whiskey liqueur? Make a make a spirit drink? Uh, uh, it's, it's worrying. But, you know, all the power to them. I believe they're doing all right now, but I don't, I, I don't know, really. I haven't kept in touch with them. Um, like I said, lots of things to discuss. But let's, let's del- delve more into new make. Fill proofs, and let's. I know it's nerdy stuff. We're gonna nerd out a bit tomorrow night. Nerdy Tuesdays, Bailey Rant Mondays, Nerdy Tuesdays. That's where we're gonna be. Ezra, you're late. Good to see you. Hope you're well. So, we're gonna do, yeah, Rant Mondays, and uh, we'll nerd out Tuesdays. Tuesdays can be our nerd out. Uh, Stephen Oss, 1984, same time every day, 8 p.m. Australian Eastern Standard, Sydney, Melbourne time, 8 p.m. Uh, just keep an eye on our stories. In uh, uh, each day, we announce the time, which is eight PM every day. But just um, um, we'll talk. We'll do. We'll do a, just a chat here between eight and eight forty-five each night. I think we're we're getting close to yeah eight thirty-seven. You know, I, I always aim for about 30, 35 minutes or so, just to chat about whiskey, uh, impart some of my knowledge, some of my wisdom to you, and answer some of your questions. And we can have a chat about some things. Uh, shower Wednesdays, God, whew. That's, that's ambitious. Jay Davis, thanks for joining, but um, just wrapping up for now. It'll, this, you can rewatch this on the stories on Instagram. It'll be up in about an hour. It takes a bit for our one to appear. It'll be on, it'll be on YouTube in about two hours. Um, thank you so much. Um, oh, Stephen Austin, yeah, new to here. I haven't seen you in here before. This is great. I'm three thanks for joining. So it's, it's on this channel that you're on now at 8 p.m. every night, um, and, unless I can't make it, but I've only skipped two out of the last seven weeks or something, so... Thank you so much, and I'll um, I'll catch you all tomorrow. Great chat, as always. Really great questions tonight, and I'm going to finish my kind leash and then call it. Cheers. I'll speak to you soon.